Good evening. I'm Hobson Wollenthal, the provost of the University of Texas at Dallas. This is a great evening in the life of UT Dallas, and it's a real pleasure to welcome all of you here. This is the inaugural lecture of the Asia Center Jaya Lecture Series. The Jaya Lectures are going to present scholars and citizens talking on topics of great importance that affect our future in tangible ways, and we will welcome you to future Jaya Lectures. The Jaya Lecture Series has been made possible by the generosity of Lake Asin and is named in honor of Lake Asin's grandmother, one of the first medical doctors in modern India, I should say one of the first women medical doctors. She was a grandmother. Lake Asin is also the creator and producer of the powerful documentary Beyond Right and Wrong, a film that addresses the uh, deep issues of how a society riven by catastrophic violence can reassemble itself and move forward. Um, the night's lecture in particular is sponsored by the Asia Center, by the UT Dallas School of Economic, Political, and Policy Sciences, and by two other organizations. First, the Genderside Awareness Project, and I would like to invite Beverly Hill, the leader of that project, to come make her remarks. Beverly. Professor Sen, Provost Wildenthal, honored guests, good evening. Tonight's event would not have been possible without the effort and generosity of many people. I want to take just a moment to recognize uh, two couples who really provided the backbone of support that we needed tonight. Pro Provost Wildenthal has already thanked Leka Singh. We thank Leka Singh. And in addition, we'd like to recognize Gita and Paul Pandian and Zenobia and Adil Adi. Thank you so much for your generosity. We are extremely pleased, let me rephrase that, we are thrilled to host Amartya Sen tonight. Professor Sen won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1998. He was also the first person who ever thought to measure the number of missing women. And in 1990, he devised a, a method to calculate that and found that an astonishing 100 million women were missing from the human population. After those findings, Professor Sen became the first to sound the alarm about this problem, which we now call gendercide. The term refers to the elimination of females from the population due to social choice and social behavior. Tonight, Professor Sen will illuminate us more on this subject and perhaps more importantly, engage us in looking for creative solutions. As you came in, I hope you noticed the slides in front of you. They were hard to miss. Um, those slides present an inspiring list of individuals, businesses, and organizations who have come together to initiate change. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you for your leadership and your moral courage. As we move forward from tonight, and we will move forward, this is just the beginning, we will be looking to you for support uh, as we work to empower women. We want to make Dallas-Fort Worth the epicenter of a movement for change. We want to empower women by educating girls, by providing job skills and microfinance to women, and by offering women maternal and reproductive health care to assist them in their vital, cherished, 
and sometimes dangerous role as child bearers. In the words of United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, let us make the, first, the 21st century the century of women. The rights and empowerment of girls and women must be at the heart of everything we do. Thank you so much. Thank you, Beverly. Our other sponsoring organization is the South Asia Democracy Watch, and I'd like to welcome Amir Makani to make this remark. Good evening. Distinguished guest, Provost Hobson Waterfall, and Professor Amrita Sen, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Amir Makani. I'm a president of South Asia Democracy Watch. As a democracy advocacy group, we believe that gender injustice is the biggest impediment to the just society. Injustice is an athema to democracy, and gender injustice call for conscious to action. I'm grateful to all of our partners in, the, in this endeavor, highlighting one of the most important discussion of our time the board member of South Asia Democracy Watch, the Gender Side Awareness Project, and Asia Center at UT Dallas, and all who have helped in making this happen. This event reminds us our civilization, our ecology, and our future is under threat. Please don't consider this conference as a conclusion of process, but take it as a beginning of this discussion we at South Asia Democracy Watch is fully committed to support and partner with any movement in women empowerment project, as this is essential evident element of our success of democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, I have the privilege of introducing our speaker tonight. Dr. Marta Sin. Uh, Dr. Sin is a scholar and philosopher whose purview is the global human condition, both individual and collective. His research and many writings, books, and essays have had profound impacts on our understanding of environmental issues, healthcare issues, economic and social progress issues, of ethics, and in particular, of tonight, uh, he's been a pioneer in elucidating the profoundly important role of women's rights and women's health in society. Uh, Dr. Sin is at, at home, literally, in the world's greatest universities, and he has received so many honors from so many societies, organizations, and nations that his award of the 1998 Nobel Prize is almost superfluous. We are all tonight honored by his presence here, and it is my privilege to introduce him to you, Dr. Sin. <laughs> Professor Rosenthal, um, Beverly, and Amir, and other friends. I feel, of course, very deeply honored for being asked to give this lecture here tonight, a joyous lecture of the University of Texas in Dallas. That privilege, which I must appreciate, much appreciate, is further enlarged by the co-hosting of this lecture by UT Dallas Asia Center, the School of Economics, Political and Public Sciences, the Gender Side Awareness Project, and South Asia Democracy Watch. It's extremely nice for me to be able to rub shoulders with people who run these distinguished organizations 
of research and action. And there is, for there is so much to admire in their work that these highly motivated people do across the globe. So I thank them all for giving me this opportunity. Now I have a special request. It's almost a phobia. Uh, I quite like some light in the auditorium. Is it possible? Uh, you know, because it's complete darkness. One is never quite sure one, whether one is speaking to oneself. <laughs> <laughs> it would be nice to be reassured that there are some people there. Uh, so thank you. That oh, that's much better. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. The topic chosen by the sponsors of this lecture, dealing with women's survival and empowerment, is critically important for the world in which we live. And the subject deserves far more attention than it tends to get. My primary focus of attention will be on South Asia, including India, and the other countries in the region. But some of the issues uh, that I intend to discuss do have, I would claim, much wider, indeed, uh, global relevance. Inequality between women and men has been, through history, one of the persistent features of social disparity across the world. While this inequality has come down sharply in many parts of the world, its hold has remained strong in other countries. In fact, in one form or another, gender inequality is a global phenomenon. Even though the form of this inequality varies in many distinct ways in different parts of the world. Gender inequality has, as it were, many faces. Indeed, inequality between women and men is not one affliction, but a multitude of ailments. Sometimes the discrepancies in different fields are quite invariant with each other. There may be um, no significant inequality in one sphere, but a great deal of inequality in another. For example, modern Japan has no particular gender bias in nutrition or healthcare or school education. There is a sharp contrast here with the educational and health inequalities between the genders in North Africa, West Asia, South Asia, and some parts of East Asia. And yet, Japanese women seem to have considerable relative difficulty in securing high leadership positions in administration or science or technology or business or governance. So gender inequality can have many different faces. In many other cases, gender inequality of one type tends to encourage and sustain gender inequality of other kinds. Interlinked consequential analysis can then be critically important within the large corpus of gender relations in general. And we have to pay particular attention to these connections in order to examine and scrutinize how the different aspects of gender inequality respectively work and go survive. For example, when women lack decisional power within the family, which amounts to a deprivation of women's effective agency, this can adversely affect their own well-being as well as those of others, of children and sometimes of men too. The different kinds of deprivations may not only move together and be covariant, but they may also be linked with each other through causal connections. I've discussed elsewhere many of these distinct but interlinked types of gender inequality, particularly in an essay called Many Faces of Gender Inequality, which originally came out in the New Republic, and I will not pursue them further here. It's, however, worth mentioning here that some of the traditional cures to gender, gender inequality that we have tended to rely on, such as female education, women's outside employment, women's opportunity to earn independent income, and so on, work extremely well in removing many distinct features of persistent gender inequality, but do not in themselves seem to overcome gender inequality of particular types, especially what can be called high-tech gender inequality, related in particular 
to the use of techniques of sex determination of the fetus and their use in selective abortion of female fetuses. While women's literacy and gainful employment may do wonders in removing gender-related disparity in mortality rates of women compared with men and of girls with heavy boys, they have not in themselves been adequately effective in preventing sex-specific feticide in the, in the subcontinent and indeed elsewhere. I shall have more to say on these particular problems presently. However, before that, I would like to touch briefly on an issue of nomenclature that can actually, may look remote, but in fact can actually throw some light on the role of our conceptual thinking and its practical consequences. The expression gender, as it is used in the term gender inequality, can refer to societal relations between women and men, and in, in, in the present context it does, including divisions and inequalities between them. This usage, however, does not match the earlier grammar-oriented sense in which the term gender had its established use. Indeed, I remember uh, very clearly the resistance, indeed opposition, that came from old-fashioned users of language that we encountered, those of us who were trying to use the term gender in this larger social sense, going well beyond grammatical declinations. This would be about the 1970s. The critics told us we were misusing language and completely messing up the art of communication. Formidable authorities were invoked, invoked from Henry Fowler, the great grammarian, the author of the classic modern English usage, to the ancient theorist of language, Protagoras, in the fifth century BC, who warned us to stick to old and correct use of words. The new and broader usage of the term gender as a classificatory device to reflect social differences between women and men was, we were firmly told, some kind of a linguistic error even worse than splitting infinitives. Were the, were the grammarians right? I'm afraid they were not. Much before modern English grammar established itself, the term gender had emerged as a marker of categories in general, not just of grammatical categories. Indeed, the Latin word genus, or the Middle English, gender, or the French genre, from which the English present word gender evolves, refers only to different types, distinct categories. There's nothing about grammar there. It's about categorization. There's no necessity there to stick to grammatical format only. So with support from the etymology as well as common sense, societal relations between women and men could certainly be very legitimately included under the broad heading of gender or categorization of women and men. No permission is needed from grammarians for that use. As it happens, the exclusive concentration on grammar in using the term gender could not withstand, in real fact, the abandoned stream of broadened usage that the new discipline of gender studies has plentifully generated to the 80s and 90s and now. It's however useful to recollect the perspective of categorization that goes etymologically with the term gender. Among the sources of adversity that women face in survival and in, and in enjoying social opportunities is the hostility of an attitude of mind that sees women as a very different type of human beings compared with men. There are, of course, biological differences between men and women, but that in itself need not generate the question, the doubt, that women may not be deserving of similar treatment and the same attention that male-dominated societies have tended to give to men. The subject of boy preference, an extraordinary social attitude that seemed to influence many people 
and particularly many parents, or soon to be parents, relates to the idea of an imagined fundamental distinction with normative and affiliative significance that does not follow from whatever biological differences exist between men and women. By reference is a peculiar mental phenomenon, the wide prevalence of which in many countries in the world, including in much of South Asia, is as consequentially momentous as it is arbitrary in origin and in the implicit philosophy on which it is based. Gender equality is a cluster of pervasive social disparities generated by prejudice and arbitrary conceptual divisions which keep large numbers of people across the world in a deprived and sometimes precarious state. It impoverishes the lives not only of women themselves, but also of men and of children who would benefit from more active and equitable participation of women in social and public life. With these general observations, let me plunge straight into some features of our world with, as I mentioned earlier, a particular focus on India and South Asia. There are, in fact, certain oddities in the nature of gender inequality in India and to a great extent in the rest of South Asia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and elsewhere too. Many features of gender inequality are not e easily visible in, in India, at least not strikingly so. Unlike in some countries where women relatively rarely take jobs outside their homes, we tend to find a large number of active women in nearly all walks of life in India, sometimes in leadership positions in academia, in journalism, in public speaking, in business activities, in medical care, and in other professional work. Seen from this perspective, it might look as if India has had a big success in eliminating gender inequality. And there may well be fragmentary elements of truth in that diagnosis. And yet, the big fact is that gender inequality is massively present in social, economic, and even political life of India. It's important to identify areas in which disparities are large and consequential, and how they can be best tackled and removed. Let me begin by commenting on two particular aspects of gender inequalities in India. One, security and safety of women, and two, the far-reaching implications of boy preference in large parts of India. The insecurity of women has received prominent attention recently in India, particularly after the massive agitation and public discussions that followed a brutal gang rape in 2012 in Delhi of a young woman called Jyoti, who was training to be a physiotherapist in a medical school. She eventually died of her inju injuries. The report of this gang rape led to mass demonstration and protest on the streets of India's major cities for many days, indeed many weeks, and to strong demand in specially convened public meetings that things have to change. These protests and agitations received unprecedented coverage in all the media, from newspapers to radio, television, and internet. There was also much public criticism of established arrangements of policing and of the execution of law and order, including the judicial system. The police were reprimanded for their failure to protect the safety of women. The legal system drew fire for its feebleness in providing justice to the raped and assaulted victims who were often treated in a way that made them very reluctant to take cases to the court. The media channels were denounced for their negligence about reporting on women's predicament. And the Indian society was chastised, I would argue rightly, for its inability to ensure the security of women. The agitations have already led to some changes, much overdue, in criminal law through the Criminal Law Amendment Act, passed in March 2013. It has also led to a reorientation of the media towards greater coverage 
And the papers are now reporting great across the country with much zeal. In fact, it has become such a major issue now that in many of the papers, um, you, you have to read about two or three pages of rape report coming from everywhere before you can turn to other news. Now this is, of course, um, invigorated press, and, uh, and, and, and that um, some people complain against because uh, it's like a kind of background cleaning of every bit of information on that. But compared with what it was, namely not to discuss it at all, this is much clearly a much better alternative. But this invigorated press discussion has also led to the question whether India does have a special rape problem with exceptionally high frequency of this particular crime. All this is, is actually, before I go into the factual analysis, very welcome, especially, as I mentioned, compared with the previous neglect of the security concerns of women. But it is not clear that the nature, including the complexity of the problem to women's security, is being adequately understood. It is possible, and I would say it's even probable, that India's problem does not lie in especially higher frequency of rape but in the failure of policing and protection that the administration provides to vulnerable women. The United Nations Office on Drug and Crimes gives the incident of rape in India for 2010 as 1.8 per 100,000 people, one of the lowest in the world. India's figure of 1.8 can be compared with countries across the globe for example, 27.3 in the USA, 28.8 in the United Kingdom, 63.5 in Sweden, and 120 in South Africa. India's recorded number, 1.8, is without any doubt a substantial underestimate. It's entirely possible that only a fraction of the actual rapes get reported, given the unfriendliness of the reporting procedure. However, even if we take five times, or perhaps even 10 times, assuming that nine out of 10 rapes that occur in India go unreported, that corrected figure, that corrected number of rapes in India would still be very substantially lower than those in the USA or UK or Sweden or South Africa, or in the rest of the world, in Europe and America. And in much of the world, in fact, even with the assumption that there's no underreporting in these other countries like USA and Europe. It does seem plausible to argue that India's problem is not especially high frequency of rape, prop, rape um, but a huge problem with making rape a seriously monitored and addressed issues, with all that implies about the lack of public policy and of preventive, pl preventive pl planning. There's also very little understanding of the regional variations within India in the occurrence of rape and the ca causal factors that might be behind this within India diversity. The rate of, rate of recorded rape per 100,000 people is 2.8 for Delhi. I'm quoting from the figure for 2011, which is the last I have. 2.8 in Delhi, compared with 1.2 in Mumbai, 1.1 in Bangalore, 0 0.9 in Chennai, and 0 0.3 in Calcutta. Since there's nothing to indicate that recording of rape is more efficient in Delhi than in other cities, in fact, informal evidence suggests just the contrary, it's remarkable that Delhi has a record that is more than nine times worse than Calcutta's. No matter how unfriendly to women Indian society might or might not be, there is no reason why Delhi cannot even come close to making the capital of India at least as safe as some of the other cities of India already are. There are also important questions about some neglected aspects women's security that have not come into limelight as rapes of the kind committed on duty in December 2012 have. 
One of them relates to the widespread evidence that sexual trafficking of young women is widespread in India. The victims often come from very poor families whose plights generate, alas, alas, far less media interest in India than the fate of a young woman training in a medical college with whom the articulate middle classes in India find it relatively easy to identify. The dominant classes of well-off people in India do very often know someone or other who has been sexually harassed, or sometimes even one who has been raped. But the poorest families from which young girls are trafficked belong to a different and unknown universe altogether. The media's bias in catering to the relatively affluent social classes can have a devastating effect in keeping some major crimes well hidden, even when other crimes generate public discussion and outrage. I turn now to the other issue I've flagged, uh, an extremely distressing aspect of gender bias in India and in the, in sub, in, in the, in the South Asian subcontinent, which shows little sign of going away is the preference for boys over girls. One of the most pernicious manifestations of this pro-moral male bias is the relatively higher mortality rates of girls compared with boys, not because of killing of girls. Uh, I'm not talking about uh, feticide here now. I'm talking about boys and girls. Not because of killing of girls. Infanticide is a terrible crime, but its frequency is, in fact, very low in, throughout the world and in South Asia, too. In the demographically, they're completely negligible. That doesn't make them any less horrendous in terms of the moral nastiness of, the, uh, of infanticide when it occurs. But in terms of the magnitude of the problem, that's nowhere near what we are looking at, the other side, the, the other kind, the, the people who die, the girls who die of neglect, the, uh, and, and the fetuses that, are, that are, are not, uh, do not come to maturity. Uh, but because, uh, mainly because the quiet violence of neglect and of health and illness of female children in comparison with the attention of male children received so little attention. Again, infanticide, if there is one reported, it's a kind of thing like a train accident. Uh, people like concentrating on this kind of attention. I once used, I'm sorry, I'm going off the script now, once used in the Delhi lecture uh, class, a, a figure that was, I think UNICEF had started, saying the number of infants who die because of medical neglect in, in the world is like 65 Boeing 747 crashing, fully loaded with children. And uh, I thought that this would have a major impact. It did have a major impact. And I, when I asked one of the students whether it made him think more, since I was always I was a young teacher, trying to find out how to best teach, and did it make you think more? And he said, yes, it has put me off flying. And so it's not absolutely clear that you get the intended effect. But certainly, accidents and murders, etc., do generate interest uh, and, and attention. And I guess they have their usefulness when, they, when they're properly, properly assimilated. This, as, uh, the, the bias of boy preference is not unique to India or to South Asia. And it applies to a wider cluster of countries extending from North Africa and West Asia to East Asia, including, including in a surprisingly strong, strong form in China. I've written on the global phenomenon of missing women earlier in the New York Review of Books um, and, uh, and the British Medical Journal at about the same time. Predictably, of course, very few people read the British Medical Journal. But the New York Review of Books had a bigger readership, partly because I guess it was on the cover. These studies were based on data up to 1980s, I should say. The paper was published in 1990. And the missing woman, 
who were then identified reflected nothing of sex specific abortion. That has not come into the story. But fewer mortality differentials between boys and girls, mainly due to the impact of discrimination in healthcare against girls with some boys, and to some extent with uh, uh, women with uh, men. In fact, I first study, the uh, first couple of studies I did were, uh, before the Wissing Woman, these were done in the 80s, uh, early 80s, in fact. Uh, was one was I studied um, at some Bombay hospitals to see what state were the boys and girls when they were admitted. And it turned out that the girls were much more ill than the boys when they were taken to hospital. Which another way of looking at it is that the girls have to be much more ill before they are taken to the hospital, which indicates, of course, exactly the same attitudinal difference which I've been talking about. And another one I did was a, a set of villages in India where I weighed, this is a cross-section study, but I tried to use as longitudinal, namely, I weighed all the children, different age groups, from zero, just born, to five years of age. And at the time of birth, girls and boys seemed to weigh much the same. But by the time they're five years old, the girls were fallen very considerably behind, and not for any biological reason that you might imagine. There is none. Those discrimination between boys and girls have substantially declined, which generated, as I think um, 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 uh, Beverly mentioned, uh, I gave the number of 100 million at that time. Uh, the that number has increased, but missing women have not. Uh, in, boys and girls, in most of the affected countries over the last couple of decades, both in China and in India, and indeed in many other countries of the region, the life expectancy of women is very considerably longer than that of men. However, along with this gain has come a new line of gender inequality and a new source of missing women through the selective abortion of female fetuses based on new techniques of determining the sex of a fetus in the womb. Because of this counteracting influence, the proportion of missing women in the total population has not been declining in the affected countries, including in China and India, remain much the same. One kind of differential going down and another new thing appearing. Um, uh, the, I presented these findings and the changing pattern in a later British Medical Journal article um, to indicate how the pattern is now changed. This was in 2003. The first one is 1990. So how can we address the general issue of gender inequality and the particular problems generated by boy preference? In a very basic sense, the general answer, I would argue, is women's empowerment. There's a great deal of statistical evidence to suggest that women's active agency can bring about major changes in the way women are treated by the society. There are powerful effects of women being educated and well-schooled, a connection that Boko Haram seems to know well, which at least partly explains their wrought against schools for girls. But there are powerful effects also of women's earning power, economic role, of out, economic role outside the family, and property rights. These factors may at first sight appear to be quite disparate and long linked with each other. What they all have in common, however, is the positive contribution of each in adding force to women's agency to making women more independent and more empowered. For example, empirical investigations have brought out the way women's working, women's working outside the home and earning an independent income tend to have a powerful impact on enhancing women's standing and voice in decision-making within the household and more broadly in the society. It also had a major impact in reducing fertility rate because the lives that are most battered by over-frequent bearing and rearing of children are young women 
anything that increases their voice, and decisional role in family decision is bound to reduce the fertility rate, and it has. In fact, we found that first in comparing districts in India in the 1970s and then, 19, and then 1980s again uh, in the censuses. And um, at that time, the fertility rate in India varied between seven, uh, uh, in some districts, seven children per couple to other districts with 1.8 uh, children per couple. And 80% of that variation could be explained only by women's education and by women's gainful employment. And all the other variables, what statisticians call orthogonal, didn't have any effect. The contribution of female members of the family to its prosperity, which is often ignored when women's work, typic women work typically very hard inside the home, becomes much more difficult to neglect when women work outside the home and earn an income. Women tend, as a result, to have more quote-unquote say, both because of enhanced standing and also because of reduced financial dependence on men. Further, outside employment often has useful educational effects in terms of exposure to the world outside the household, making her agency better informed and more effective. This makes it particularly important to see the role of both social institutions, which allow women to work despite having small children and requires various arrangements for that, for the child care and so on, and of social values which find women's work outside the home socially acceptable. There's an interactive connection here between women's education and women's employment, and in particular women's literacy and schooling, making it easier for women to find work and also find suitable work that are combinable with whatever challenges biological differences pose. Similarly, female education strengthens women's agency and also tends to make this agency better informed and functionally powerful. The ownership of property can also add to the influence and power of women in decisions within the family and beyond, being our other world work on the critical difference made by women's land ownership brings this out very clearly. The diverse variables that enhance women's social capability and effectiveness, thus having, have um, empowering roles, both individually and jointly, um, are really quite distinct. Their combined operation has to be related to the understanding that women's power, economic independence, as well as social emancipation, can have far-reaching effects on the forces and organizing principles that govern divisions within the family and can in particular influence what are implicitly accepted in people's mental framework as women's entitlement. Goes back to the distinction connected with genres and gender to which I was earlier referring. From the crude barbarity of physical violence to the complex instrumentality of health neglect, the deprivation of women is ultimately linked not only to the lower status of women, but also on the fact that of women often lack the power to influence the thinking and the behavior of other members of this society and the operation of social institutions, and sadly, sometimes do not manage to influence their own thinking, on which I shall come presently. Even though the impact of women's agency is clearly very far-reaching, there is a need to understand how the reach of agency is also qualified and restrained by the limits of information and knowledge, and ultimately also by enlightenment, by courage, and the temerity to think differently. The courage to think differently can be particularly crucial in making women's agency have the power to overturn inequities, iniquitous but intense practices and societal arrangements that are often accepted as part and parcel of an assumed, quote unquote, natural order. For example, in China and South Korea, the standard routes to women's empowerment, such as female literacy and female economic independence, in which both Korea and China have had major achievements and which have 
done much for these countries in removing some standard forms of gender inequality, um, uh, in, including uh, the discrimination in health and education and so on, have not been able to um, stem immediately on it and on its own the tide of natality inequality working through sex-specific abortion, which reflects boy preference and specially targeted female fetuses. Um, China still has one of the highest in the world, um, well, or one of the lowest ratio of girls being born um, uh, and at, at the time of, uh, compared with boys at, at birth. Uh, Korea had very high rate too, had. This has led to initiatives in these countries to consciously calculate cultivate the value of having daughters and not just sons. I would like to say here that the picture is not entirely dark. In South Korea, with explicit attention being paid to confronting social prejudice and with determined efforts to broaden public reasoning, the hold of boy preference seems to have weakened very considerably. This has not yet happened sufficiently in China. And here I think China Mostly Korea had learned a great deal from China, but China can learn something from Korea here. In India, too, even as women's increased empowerment has contributed to the reduction of excess female mortality, the tendency to use new technology to abort female fetuses have grown in many parts of the country, um, despite the fact that in already by 1990s, the Indian parliament outlawed sex determination of fetuses until, unless the mother's life is threatened. This is not a law that has been effective at all. Women's education alone had not been able, alas, to serve as a strong barrier to this regressive movement. Indeed, there is some evidence that the immediate agency for taking decisions on sex-selective abortion is quite often the mothers themselves. What is crucially important in this context is to go beyond what an Indian, very famous judge, Justice Leela said um, in her wonderful talk that she gave about a year ago in the Indian International Center called the Girl Child and Governance, called the patriarchal mindset, which not only affects men, but the patriarchal mindset could even affect women's own thinking. This raises important issues as to how to interpret the agency of women and its social influence. It is, I would argue, important to see the concept of agency as stretching beyond immediate control over decisions. The fuller sense of crucial idea of agency must inter alia involve the freedom to think, the freedom to question established values, and freedom to dispute traditional priorities that your families may have followed for um, uh, countless generations. Agency freedom must, in fact, include the freedom to think. That's, I think, a very important point here. Without being severely restrained by pressured conformism and by the ignorance of how the prevailing practices in the rest of the world differ from what can be observed locally. There's a strong tendency, not absent in South Asia, that there is nothing very peculiar about these practices in South Asia. That's just not the case. For example, what is particularly critical in remedi remedying the terrible biases in natality discrimination and the prevalence of sex-specific abortion is the role of women's informed and independent agency, including the power to overcome unquestionably unquestioned to overcome inherited values and attitudes that were unquestioningly accepted. What may make a real difference in dealing with this new and high-tech face of gender inequality is the willingness, ability, and courage to reassess critically the dominance of received and entrenched norms. When anti-final bias in action reflect the hold of traditional masculinist values from which mothers themselves may not be immune, what is crucial is not just action, but ultimately thought and one's mind. Informed and critical agency is, is important in combating inequality 
of every kind, and no, and gender inequality um, is no exception to that. I end this talk with some brief comments on a puzzling problem, to which I don't know the answer. Puzzling problem of gender bias, gender bias, which in fact is hard to explain and which demands far more attention than it has received so far. This concerns a sharp difference within India. There's a striking regional divide between northern and western states within the country, which give clear evidence of extensive use of selective abortion of female fetuses, and the states in the south and the east of India, which typically do not. Let me first state some medical and biological regularities. Everywhere in the world, more boys are born than girls. This is a fact that is often overlooked when people start getting worried with numbers like 9,450. In fact, the female-male ratio is around 940 to 950, 940 to 955 females for 1,000 males in the European countries. The, by the way, women do better than men every age, including in fetus. There are about 91 female fetuses conceived compared with 100 male fetuses. By the time they're born, there are 95 or so fetuses, female fetuses compared with 100 males. So they're doing better even, even in the womb and then throughout the life, which is why, despite being born fewer, if we are not discriminated against and lead a long life, we end up with 105 men, or 106 men to, to 100 um, uh, women in, in, in Europe and America and, and states in India like Kerala, but not generally in, 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 in South Asia, East Asia, North Africa. Le uh, the, um, During 2005 to 2010, and I collected those figures, the average ratio of females to male at birth in Europe, average, was 943 females per 1,000 males. There are variations within the European countries which cannot plausibly be attributed to any presumed practice of sex-selective abortion. And so we have to accept a range of values for normal sex ratio, quote-unquote, normal sex ratio at birth. Not a number, but a range. Among the larger European countries, the female ratio at birth was lower than the average in a number of them. 941 in Italy, 940 in Spain, 939 in Greece, 935 in Ireland. How do the Indian states fare fair, if we take as a cutoff say 940 per 1,000, the average for Italy, Spain, and Greece, for evident, definite evidence of selective abortion of female fetuses. Since birth registration is faulty in India, the ratios of girls to boys at birth are calculated by first looking at the actual number of girls and boys in the age group 0 to 6 counted by the census, and then working backwards to the female-male birth ratio by adjusting the 06 figures for differences in age-specific mortality rate between birth and age 6, which we do actually have. So it's a fairly accurate way of doing it, though I wish they were birth registration, which would be much easier, rather than having to depend on statistical sophistication. And I'm proud of that, but it should be needed. Using this cutoff ratio, and applying it to the last census, 2011, it appears that all the states in North and West of India, without any exception, show absolutely clear evidence of a stronghold of sex selective abortion in a way that the states in East and South do not in general show. In fact, the Northern and Western states have female-male ratios at birth that are not only below the cutoff line of 940, but far below it, even below 920, all of them. This contrasts sharply with states in the south and east of India, where all states have girl-boy ratios within the European range. 
we can draw a dividing line to cut India into two halves. Um, and there, I did publish a map on that in the, in the New York Review, an article in October 2013 called um, uh, um, the, um, uh, Indian Women, the Mixed Truth. Um, so we can draw it between West and North in India, including Maharashtra, Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, Himachal Pradesh, Punjab, Haryana, Uttarakhand. And I'm being diplomatic and political here because the Indian numbers also include Kashmir. I'm not going to raise that issue because it has political implication, but it too, Indian held, if you like, Kashmir or Indian Kashmir, depending on what your politics is. Showing clear evidence of widespread sex selective abortion with female ratios, as I said, well below 920. This contrasts sharply with figures for states in the East and South, Kerala, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Bihar. Bihar. Notice that Bihar is Hindi speaking, but falls in the Eastern group, West Bengal and Assam, all of which have ratios well above 940, with Bihar just marginally so, but it's also about 940. So that the use of sex selective abortion when present is not on a scale to pull the, put the female male ratio below the cutoff line based on the Italian, Greek, and Spanish figures. Orissa is, in fact, the one mile exception in the South and East region with a ratio of 936 per 1,000, which is just below 940. But even this ratio is similar to and slightly higher than that in Ireland. Incidentally, the data from Bangladesh is um, that the female male ratio at birth um, uh, 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 from the age group zero to four and working back to birth uh, turns out to be a whackingly high 972 girls to boys. And this is quite interesting because uh, you know women are very prominent in Bangladesh and in fact, uh, uh, in my last book, jointly with Ron Dwayz, we tried to argue the fact that Bangladesh has overtaken India in many areas. Used to have two years behind 20 years ago in life expectancy, now it's three years ahead. And lower infant mortality, one lower child mortality, lower female education, and so on. 100% immunization, uh, nearly 100%, 96, compared with India, 62. So I think there's a lot to do with women's empowerment. This, I don't think, is connected with more girls being born in such number. But there is an interesting issue to look at that into the question, how, they turn, how does that happen? I'm not suggesting there are uh, sex-specific abortion of male fetuses in Bangladesh. I don't think that's really what the explanation would be. But there is a question here to be asked. But coming back to India, why is there such a regional difference? Indeed, such a sharp contrast. No convincing explanation of the divide has been offered in the established literature on gender inequality in India, even though a simple north-south divide in the treatment of women has been discussed in the anthropological literature, for example, by Iravati Karve. That was a different divide between the north and the south, and Bengal and Assam and Bihar were in the north on the other side, and the south was below that. That's not what we are looking at. From the, um, uh, we have to, what we have to do is to do much more research to get an understanding uh, in this work. In the proposed research work, uh, which I'm really trying, uh, in, involved in right now, and I, I won't have time to talk about it. If in QA anyone wants to know what are the lines to think about, I'd be happy to come back to it. I want to go into causal plausibility of possible factors that could make a difference, including the influence of language and literature, as well as of politics and social movements, which one has to see. There's a huge research challenge here, but the findings, if the research is successful, should be of great interest, both for a fuller understanding, the complexity of South Asian culture, cultures, as well as for policies for promoting gender equity, taking note of the causal features underlying the regional contrast. 
the subject, so the subject on which I've been talking generates, I'm afraid, more questions than answers. I hope you're not discouraged by this. I certainly am not. There are many features of gender inequality that we did not understand adequately earlier, but now we do. The shape, including the pattern of gender inequality, is not only one of the most important challenges that the world faces today, it's also one of the most difficult problems to address fully. But there is, I believe, no reason to lose hope. And I think we shall never get the right answers unless we ask the right questions first. Thank you. I have to apologize because of my metal knees. I look even more decrep decrepit when I've been standing at a place. Look, you might be worried that I'm about to fall, but I won't. The blood will start circulating again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I think I'm more or less all right. <laughs> Dr. Sen has very graciously uh, agreed to answer some questions, which I think are being collected in the audience. And uh, I will read them out, and he will uh, answer them. Even though the, the lecture has answered so many questions, as well as asked Thank so you. many. The first question that we have, Dr. Sen, is the question, why does gendercide happen in more affluent families than in poor families? Uh, well, I think, is, is, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's as a generalization, it's not a very hard, it's not a very um, exact generalization. Um, I think, first of all, sex-selective abortion is an expensive process. It's, it's a costly process. Uh, secondly, I think in terms of variables that we looked at, though poor families are often are less educated, the distinction between boys and girls probably are far less. And also, the, as far as gainful employment is concerned, uh, in the lower class families, very often uh, women work much more. If you look at Rajasthani laborers in Delhi, you would say that they're uh, women and they're doing very, very low wage jobs. Now, these factors are among the factors that causally one would expect to be associated with less gender bias. I would tend to look at that way, but it's not, a, it's not invariably the case that that is, that is so. For the kind of um, what, uh, to use a technical term, the kind of fuzzy set that we see here, it's an adequately closed examination, I believe. What do you think is the effect of upbringing in the formative years as a predictor of whether someone will become anti-woman? Should we address this issue and make aware of Effects kids of, when they're growing up? I heard submarine, but I couldn't have heard it right. Not the effect of submarines. What were you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a serious problem between the, new, uh, between the confrontation of India and Pakistan. So I'm very worried about submarines. <laughs> but, but I hadn't thought of it in this context. <laughs> so can you read that first one? It said, the effect of children's upbringing Oh, I'm winging, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think it's, it's gigantic, yeah. I, I, that's, a, that's also like the first question, a very good question. Um, the, um, that's how, of course, mother's education makes a difference. Because if it, uh, it, what happens is that there are many things that education and going beyond reflection uh, questioning the inherit, uh, inherited values have in changing values that are inculcated in the minds of the young. And it's very important uh, for that to happen at the time of upbringing. Because, you know, they, traditionally, um, it would, uh, 
come to children where they, they, some of the biased attitudes will come to them when they're extremely young, uh, even in division of food, etc. whether the boys should get something or get the first choice or, or more and so on. So I think up upbringing is very central. But in addition to family-based upbringing, there's also the issue, of course, the upbringing in the society in which you go. And that's why schooling, I think I did mention, aside from educating you, has the effect that you come and meet lots of people from other backgrounds. And you know not everyone follows the same practice. And one of the great things about prejudices is uh, that people's prejudices often differ. So you learn that other people don't share your prejudice, but share some other kind of prejudice. And that intermingling is a wonderful process. Actually, I had a PhD student. The other day I calculated, it indicates how long I've lived, that there are 155 people who have done their, their PhD with me, and with uh, me as the principal supervisor, or only supervisor. One of the earlier ones, called Chaudhry, had found that cooling has an effect. And he was not looking at gender, he was looking at agricultural practices even when the school education is not very good. It turned out that actually the idea of meeting people, lots of people from other families, not just being confined to your, is a broadening process. That's not an argument for not having good schools. Good schools should be there. <laughs> but it also, mingling is a very good way of dealing with. So it is upbringing, but also social intermingling. That's very important. This, this is a question that strikes out into a slightly different domain. It addresses the issue which uh, is, of course, a great benefit to the United States, uh, and that is the brain drain, with so many uh, talented people immigrating to the United States. How do you think that the brain drain might uh, impact the issue of uh, women's rights and women's progress? I had not thought about that question. That's very complicated. I don't know, uh, I don't know, you know, it's very complicated for many different reasons. Uh, one is that you have to know what kind of people tend to drain away, as it were, from South Asia or East Asia, or, and what are their special characteristics. You also have to see what these people do abroad. Many of the people who are being very active here actually have Asian origin, and they seem very concerned with gender issues. In, 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 in Asia, so that I have always been, there was some proposal about a brain drain tax, which I never thought made any sense at all, quite aside from the fact that it seemed to violate individual liberty, because of the fact that ideas move across borders. That doesn't mean that uh, India should train doctors to go and start and, uh, heal American patients primarily, and uh, the proportion is gigantic. And yet, it's also the, true that a uh, lot of the new medical practices in India has come because of the contact. I don't think the IT revolution would have come but for the Silicon Valley and the Silicon Valley Indians. Yeah, and, uh, uh, it's, and the numbers are gigantic. I was given a reception one shortly after my novel in the, in the Silicon Valley. And I was told by someone that only millionaires are here. And looking at the gigantic number of millionaires there, I had a kind of panic attack, <laughs> more or less. It's very complicated. Yeah. This is a more personal question. What was the trigger point in your own life to motivate you to work toward bringing change in the world? I think every child wants to bring a change in the world. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, I can't think of a point when, I can't think of a point when I didn't want to bring a change in the world, nor can I think of a point where my friends and classmates were not lecturing me on how they want to change the world. <laughs> so, so that seemed to me like a natural pastime of human beings. I'm very fortunate I got some opportunity to do it. This is, a, this is a conundrum question, and you 
don't even have to answer it. It says, do you think women need more security or more freedom? I think that's a false contrast. Uh, <laughs> freedom is a different kind of thing to be free to do. One of the things women desire, would desire, do desire most, is, is being more secure. And if they're not secure, their desire to have freedom, their conviction that that is what they value, is not being honored. So violation of security will be a violation of freedom. Similarly, uh, violation of uh, freedom, depending on what fear it is, could also lead to violation of security, which is one of the things we were discussing. For example, when you're dealing with trafficked women, it is because of the poverty that these people uh, have to be fall prey to being trafficked from poor parents' home into a dreadful life. So the, the, the lack of freedom leads to lack of security. I think they're intimately connected. But, uh, as I mentioned, Dr. Sen is a philosopher and a logician as well, and you just got a great Thank demonstration you. of his logical powers to not be trapped by that question. Uh, <laughs> let me ask you one final question, Dr. Sen. Are you optimistic about the trends of women's progress in India and in the United States? Yes. I think yes and yes. Uh, uh, I am. That doesn't mean that it would be a monotonic uh, increase, that is, without any fall. Uh, there were ups and downs, but the trend would be definitely upward. It already is. Um, yeah. You know, I was this morning when I was being interviewed by some uh, journalists, I think mostly from Pakistan, I was recollecting my friend Mahbubul Haq, who was uh, from Pakistan, in fact, and he was a classmate, a very close friend of mine. I met him in my first day in Cambridge on the way to the class and remained friend until he at last died. But he, um, we discussed this issue often because he was very keen on change. He ultimately did the human development reports, and I did the Human Development Index for him, and so on. Um, one of the things uh, we discussed, I think it was his idea, really, with which I came to agree, with which I came to agree, was that unless you have a certain amount, a certain kind of optimism, you'll never be able to do anything of significance, because you have to have some belief that your action could make a difference. And, you know, they, they, people often forget that there's some contradiction when I'm often asked the question, how would you predict the future, what would you like to be done? I said, look, these are contradictory because if what I would like to be done is going to have an effect, they would depend on whether I would succeed in doing it, whether others would let me do it, and then what I predict will depend on what I've done. So given that, you, can't, you have to ask one question or the other, but not both. I think Mabu was putting the other way, saying that you have to begin with that optimism, that you can make a difference. And of course, he did actually make a major difference in changing the way accounting goes. The Human Development Index is now most, the most widely used social indicator in the world, which he actually lived to see. Uh, so I think I am optimistic. Partly for Mabubul Haku reasons, but also because I am actually generally optimistic. And since as I grow older, I'm 81 now, I seem to become more and more optimistic. But this is not about the afterlife, I ought to tell you. <laughs> uh, friends, I think this has been an incredible evening of inspiration and information both. And again, I would like to thank Dr. Sen for being with us and gracing us with his wisdom. Thank you. Thank you.